opinion became that they were support comes from new state furniture, offering furnishings in all styles, the reflection custom design center, and the new master small food shop. Love where you live on Anderson Lane or new estate furniture. Creating community through vocal music in Central Texas for 55 years. Curious Austin's combined ensembles present Sounds of the Earth, a concert celebrating the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, featuring Randy Thompson's Frosty Eye, the text by Robert Cross, and a world premiere by Carlos Cordero. One performance only, this Saturday at 7.30 p.m. Tickets and more information at CoolersAustin.org.
I think good. we're on. Okay. Hello, welcome everyone. I'm Judy Maggio with Austin PBS, and I'm here with County Judge Sarah Eckhart. And this year, for the State of the County Address, Judge Eckhart decided we would have a conversation rather than deliver a traditional speech. So thank you for inviting me to be part of this conversation. Thank you so much because speeches are boring. <laughs> so this is gonna be a lot more fun. I hope so, I hope it'll be fun. The first question is, is kind of fun. I think there are a lot of people in our community who don't really understand what you do, what your job is. So I wanna begin by you giving me a 30 second elevator pitch on What's the role of the county judge? Sure, most people have no idea what a county judge is and it's a total misnomer. So although I am a lawyer, you're not required to be a lawyer to be the county judge. Um, there are 254 counties in the state of Texas and each one has one county judge. And the county judge presides over the commissioner's court and every one of the 254 counties has four commissioners and one county judge. So I'm essentially the chief executive of Travis County. I do policy and budget. And you have like how many employees, 5,000 employees, something like that? There are about 5,000 Travis County employees. Um, they're not all directly under the management stack of the commissioner's court. Actually, most of them are under the management stack of other elected officials. There's 51 separate elected officials in Travis County. So that is your civics lesson on county government to begin with. Second question, if you could sum up the state of the county in just what word, one word, what would that word be and why? Strong. <laughs> um, many of us are feeling a lot of turmoil at the federal level and uh, some turmoil at the state level too, even though our economy is so strong. Uh, but I'm happy to report that in Travis County, um, our, the, the state of our local government is extremely resilient and very robust. We have um, uh, higher than average educational attainment, higher than the state or the nation. We have higher median home income, uh, higher than the state or the nation. Our poverty rate is lower than the state or the nation. Um, we're blessed with ridiculous uh, environmental beauty, uh, an incredible landscape. So we're doing very, very well. And from a Travis County government perspective, we are financially good stewards of the taxpayer dollar. We were able to actually reduce the average burden of the taxpayer for the county portion of your tax bill three years running in 2014, 15, and 16. So we're doing pretty good. Much brighter than the weather is today as we it's have this a conversation. Lot, a lot brighter than the weather is today. You know, it is no secret that the state of Texas and the city of Austin rarely see eye to eye on anything. Mm -hmm. But one thing I've learned to understand about county government is that, is that you all work in concert with the state of Texas. Talk about the differences there. Another little bit of our civics le lesson on county government. Well, um, county governments are an arm of the state. Um, it's not just that we work in concert with them. We work for the Texas legislature. Uh, the Texas legislature meets only every other year, and it relies on the counties of the state of Texas to actually implement its policies over the rest of the time. So counties can only do what the state specifically authorizes us to do. We are on borrowed authority from the state. So it's not just in concert. We work for them. And you hear a lot about unfunded mandates from the Texas legislature down to the local governments. We expect unfunded mandates. That's what we exist for. We exist for the state to tell us what to do and then tell us to go tax appropriately to get it done. Travis County governs so many of the key aspects of our life and our health here in, in, in the region. So I want to kind of go down a list of those key issues. And I want you to talk about accomplishments, the good, the bad, the ugly things where you think some work really needs to be done. And I want to start with criminal justice. Sure. Um, there have been a lot of reforms happen mm -hmm. just recently. And let, let's begin with the public defender's office. Travis County, you recently decided to open up a public defender's office. Yes. Why did it take so long? Many other large communities already had a public defender's office. Um, I am over the moon excited that we have a public defender's office. There is no single silver bullet in criminal justice reform, but having a public defender's office is a huge piece of reforming our system. By having an institutional column in, in criminal defense, rather than relying on a 
um, a, a universe of many, many criminal defense attorneys who are um, in their own individual offices seeing only their piece of the pie. By having a public defender's office that sees a bigger picture, uh, we're going to have an institutional column that's able to push back on the system and really um, uh, help us move our investment in human capital out of criminal justice and into other more appropriate contexts like healthcare, workforce development, uh, um, family supports, and things like that. So, what took so long? A um, couple of things. First of all, a public defender's office is expensive. It will be about $15 million initially, and that's only taking, that, that's taking less than 30% of the criminal justice cases. So we don't have $15 million sitting in a drawer somewhere. Um, so we are working with the state, and even though the state only covers about 11 cents on the dollar that we spend in criminal defense, uh, indigent criminal defense, the Texas Indigent Defense Commission is giving us a grant for $25 million over the next five years to help us pull up that public defender's office. So um, the cost was one reason. The other reason is we have been blessed with a top flight law school in our backyard that churns out lawyers every year. And we have relied on that pretty constant flow of young lawyers coming out of those law firms and resupplying our criminal defense bar. Um, um, but again, at the end of the day, no matter how good our private criminal defense bar is, it can't replace an institutional column of defense that's able to see big picture trends and push back. There's been a lot of issues that have arisen over communities of color and their treatment in the criminal justice system. How do you think Travis County is addressing that in positive ways and where do you think work needs to be done where communities of color are not um, singled out in uh, more significant ways than other communities? We have a tremendous amount of work to do there. Um, I know that you saw the recent APD study on stops showing that we are going in the wrong direction with regard to um, traffic stops. Um, uh, black and brown individuals are stopped at a higher percentage than their percentage in the general population, and white and Asian individuals are stopped at a lower percentage than their uh, representation in the population. We did do a study with an independent uh, outfit to take a look at racial disparity inside the criminal justice system after arrest, after somebody's already entered uh, okay. booking. And it found no racial disparity, but it did find uh, a compounded disparity based on your representation, whether you have paid representation or whether you have court-appointed representation. Um, this is a, a super wonky way to say we have a lot of work to do. Having better representation for indigent defendants is going to be a big part of that. Also, really drilling down on substance use disorder. We had 125,000 cases last year that were drug and alcohol related through our criminal justice system. Um, is it appropriate to handle substance use disorder, which is a mental health, behavioral health issue in the criminal justice context? Absolutely not. But we don't have enough capacity in the healthcare context to deal with this. 211 people died of overdose in 2018. So these two issues are really interconnected, uh, the issues of mental health, health and human services, and criminal justice reform. Absolutely. If you could wave a magic wand and, and make it better, what, what would be the systems you would put in place? Um, if I could wave a magic wand, I would want to pull up capacity in the non-criminal voluntary context for um, health care services in trauma and substance use disorder. A tremendous amount of what we're seeing in the criminal justice system is a result of untreated mental illness, um, self-medication through substance uses, including alcohol. Um, and also uh, impulse control issues that are coming uh, from an untreated trauma. Um, it would be so much more humane to treat that in the medical, um, mental health care context, but we just don't have the capacity there. 
the state of Texas is in the bottom half in per capita expenditures on healthcare, on education, on um, uh, services for those who are um, at the poverty rate. We're, we're just not investing in that kind of opportunity infrastructure at the state level. So we're going to invest in it at the local level, even though we're under a 3.5% revenue cap. And we're going to talk a lot about that, too, because I know that uh, has, has led to some local governments feeling a bit hamstrung. Um, back to criminal justice, I, I know that one of the things that took place here in the county was um, changes on how people facing most misdemeanor crimes are handled. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit more about that and, and if you think it'll make a difference. Oh, I think it'll make a big difference. We've had a huge drop in um, bookings at Central Booking. We've had a 20% drop in cases filed since 2014 in the criminal justice context. Um, most of that drop was in misdemeanor cases. Um, we currently have a direct file system with the police department where cases are direct filed from booking. We're not going to do that anymore. I, I have every reason to believe that whoever is the next county attorney, um, we will not be doing direct file and misdemeanors any longer. Um, there'll be a much higher level of scrutiny as to whether there's truly a public safety threat in this intervention. There's, there, criminal justice is a sharp and heavy sword. There's no reason to swing that sword if there's not a public fa safety threat. Um, if there's not a public safety threat, our job in government is to provide resources and uh, assist folks so that they can get beyond whatever life circumstances brought them to this moment. Anything else on the criminal justice issue that, that you'd like to discuss before we move down? I have a long list here of different issues, and I, I want to uh, move sure. into health and human services, but anything else that you think this is such a big part of what the county does? It's huge. Half of our budget goes to criminal justice, civil justice, and law enforcement. Uh, and that's appropriate, frankly, because, as I said, we're an arm of the state, and the biggest mandate that the state gives us is the entire justice system. We must do that under Texas Constitution. We must deliver um, civil courts, criminal courts, and a county jail. So one thing, we have, we have a county jail, and many folks say, if you build it, you will fill it. I'm here to tell you, we are proof, at least here, that that doesn't happen. We've had a functional capacity of 2,700 since 2008. Um, I just checked our population before coming down. Right now, we're at 2,200. We're usually at about 2,000. We don't plan on building additional capacity. We do want to knock down some of our old crappy buildings and put up some new better ones so that it won't be so traumatizing staying with us. Um, but there are some folks who do present a public safety threat for some period of time. And for those folks, we do want to be able to bring them into a county jail that doesn't further traumatize them um, and then moves them on to services in a humane way. So we plan to build a new women's facility, but we will knock down three other buildings after that women's facility comes up, and we've already decommissioned 192 beds. So don't expect us to have more capacity. Expect us to have better capacity. More quality capacity. Newer buildings. <laughs> yes. The other thing is we absolutely need a crime lab that's under scientists mm -hmm. and not under law enforcement or prosecution. So we are working with the city of Austin. Um, there's something called the Quattrone Report that's about to come out, where we will be looking at our options for moving our crime lab services under scientific supervision uh, exclusively, independently. And that will be an expense, but that is an investment in justice that I think will, is, is important to do. And will it help with some of the backlogs that have been an issue in the past? It'll help with some of the backlogs. It will help with speedy trial. Um, and it will certainly help um, uh, making sure that we are only swinging that sharp and heavy sword when it's truly needed and we're not swinging it at innocent people. Um, that should never happen, ever. Um, so we will we'll see, see how that goes. It's going to be expensive, <laughs> but we got to do it. Um, we also will be expanding our, um, our no cash release system and finding tweaks inside of that. There's been a lot of talk about our um, uh, bond system. 
We've had about a 70% personal recognizance bond release rate for years, but we can make it even better. We can speed up that process and streamline it even more. When we talk about health and human services, what, what would you like to tout as accomplishments, and, and where do you think more work needs to be done when it comes to the county? Our health and human services, we're seeing our population in the unincorporated area growing uh, more rapidly than the population inside the city limits. Um, we are seeing an out-migration of folks who are um, financially strapped. They're cost, cost housing, uh, housing cost burdened. They are working a couple of jobs. Um, we have a 2.4% unemployment rate, so that's crazy. Everybody's working, but not everybody's making ends meet. So the average income for a single mom head of household is $37,000 in Travis County. You think you could That's make tough. it on 37,000 with a couple of kids at home? That's tough. Um, so we need to help those folks out. I'm very, very proud that our Health and Human Services Department has um, about half of its budget is dedicated to um, uh, targeted direct services that are super nimble. Because we do contract services rather than in-house services, we're able to move, pivot quickly, whether the need is workforce related, uh, housing related, um, whether it's substance use disorder related, um, parenting's, you know, parenting and recovery related. Um, by having that kind of nimbleness, we're able to uh, uh, tweak our investments on a five-year cycle. Right now, that investment is at about 22 million. I think it needs to grow by at least 10%. So under the 3.5% revenue cap, we need to find two and a half to $5 million annually that's ongoing money to add to that. Um, I'm hoping to leverage the Palm School, which is a very valuable piece of property that we own, um, to take that one-time money, that one-time value in that property, and turn it into ongoing cash for Health and Human Services. So you brought up Palm School. I was going to ask about that later, but there's this, as an outside observer looking in, looks like there's a log jam between City Hall and the county on what to do with this tax issue and land swap issue mm -hmm. with Palm School, the Expo Center, the tax situation with the Convention Center. I want to know your perspective on this uh, and if any progress is being made, because it seems like this has been kind of an ongoing battle between the city and the county, two entities that typically get along pretty well. We, we work so well together about 98% of the time, and it's only the 2% that ever gets any coverage. <laughs> <laughs> darn um, media. Darn media. <laughs> well, it's boring when we're all getting along, right? It's true. <laughs> There's no drama in that. Um, so right now what we're looking at is this downtown piece of property that Travis County has held for years as our headquarters for Health and Human Services. But the population that Health and Human Services serves doesn't live near Cesar Chavez and I-35 anymore. Right. So it's time for us to move out of that property. But it is a historic property and a property of deep cultural significance and value. Absolutely. So we believe at Travis County, by putting restrictive covenants on that property, saying that Palm School must be preserved in its historic context, restored and made available for public uses um, that include educational uses, that we can then say to the private sector, you can develop the rest of the block, but you must renovate, maintain, and provide Palm School as a public resource. Um, by doing that, we still believe that there's significant economic value in that block and we could turn that significant economic value into um, long-term, deeper investment in health and human services. So we've been working with the city on that. The city would like to see it as a park. Um, there are two other parks immediately adjacent to it. Um, I'm sure that we can come to some sort of agreement. Um, and I'd like to invite the private sector in to help us look at how we could re-envision that corner and still um, find some significant reinvestment in health and human services from using that property. I know we can get there. So where does the Expo Center and the Convention Center, I feel like I need a flow chart for this. Yeah. How does this, all this all fit together? The Exposition Center is a, is a separate property that the city of Austin actually owns. 
Um, but we operate a, a building on it, the Exposition Center, that we um, participate with the rodeo in having built. So the idea is that 126 acres, knowing that we need deeper investment in the Eastern Crescent, um, the Eastern Crescent that the city of Austin really needs some anchor institutions that really give it place, that really provide um, housing and employment and um, uh, honor. And rodeo has been a big part of that portion of East Austin. It needs to be redeveloped. It's 126 acres, and Travis County is ready and willing to do it along with the rodeo. Um, but the city could also do it. They own the property, and it's part of their larger uh, Decker Lake property, the Walter E. Long property. So whether it's the city redeveloping that along with the rodeo in order to honor the citizens of Eastern Travis County, or whether it's the county doing it, I'm really agnostic, but I think it needs to be done and I think it needs to be done soon so that we don't lose the rodeo to uh, a surrounding county. So where does the hotel occupancy tax fit into this triangle, this land swap issue? That Where that fits in, I, I have been a bit of a nudge when it comes to the rodeo, saying that I don't believe that property taxes are an appropriate source to put into the redevelopment of that tract because it does attract so many people from outside the county. Um, from all over the state of Texas, in fact. So when you're doing a sports arena or a special events center, um, normally a local government will use hotel occupancy tax, visitor taxes. But Travis County doesn't have any visitor taxes. We could. We could have 2% visitor tax under uh, the local government code. But You'd like to have that. We would like to have that, but the city's currently using it, along with an additional 9% under the tax code. So we're asking the city to um, just use the 9% under the tax code so that we can use the portion under the local government code. We don't have access to the tax code. We're not authorized to use that hot tax. We are authorized to use the local government code. Um, we can't until the city stops using it. So we're working with the city to get a date certain by which they will stop using it so we can start using it for the Exposition Center. But there's no guarantee that will happen. No, not yet. But again, I, um, I remain hopeful. I know that the city has a lot going on right now. Um, the land development code being That's been a very, very big issue. Front and center. And yeah. also the convention center is a very big issue yeah. for them. So I, I am hopeful that we'll be able to come to some certainty soon. I can't plan, the commissioner's court can't plan and can't invest without some certainty regarding the hot tax and the, the property ownership of the exposition center. Let's move on, so to speak, and talk about transportation. Okay. Um, and, and this is very much from a regional lens when it comes to the county, but you know, it is the number one complaint most people have living in this region is transportation. From a county perspective, what, what do you see as progress uh, and where does the work need to be done? And then let's also tap into some infrastructure issues with roadways and, and how that fits into the picture. Um, more than 80% of people in Travis County drive alone in their cars to work each day. But you usually ride your bike, right? I ride my bike about half the time. Um, and, you know, I, I have the luxury of being able to ride sure. my bike. Yeah. Not everybody can. You live close enough, yeah. Yeah. True. So I don't crow about that too much. It's, you know, I'm, it's, a, uh, it's a wonderful thing that I can do. Um, Transportation is a very big issue for us, and transportation is also a very big health and human service issue. Um, the, the, uh, second to housing, um, transportation is a huge cost burden for individuals who are, are you know, on the margins. It costs a, a family about $10,000 a year to own a car. When you consider the car payment, the insurance, the maintenance, the tolls, um, that's a lot. That's a lot for somebody who's living at $40,000 a year. Especially that single mom that you mentioned. Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. So if we can expand our transit options throughout Travis County beyond the CAP Metro service area, we can really make a difference for people who are struggling financially. Um, so we have uh, used Travis County resources and pulled down some federal dollars to extend transit to uh, uh, expand transit around Maynard to extend transit around um, Colony Park. 
We are looking for ways that we can partner with the Central Texas Regional Mobility Authority to get park and ride systems uh, all along their toll roads in order to contract with CAP Metro to bring buses out further into the county and even into other counties. And we're also partnering with uh, CAP Metro and the city of Austin on Project Connect. But we are working at a bit of a disadvantage because the Texas legislature does not allow counties to put property tax toward transit. Ah, this is another thing that comes into play when you're talking about your, in some essence, working for the state of Texas, yeah. So we are finding ways to um, make investments in transportation and transit specifically around uh, populations that have low opportunity. And so we are making it a health and human service issue rather than a transportation issue, which makes it possible for us to fund it. So how would that work? We look for low opportunity census tracts, and then we pull down uh, community development block grants from the federal okay. government, uh, and look for other means of funding, like the CTRMA and the park and ride circumstance. I think toll revenue is a very appropriate revenue source for transportation, transit infrastructure. So we'll find a way. But you can't use property taxes. We can't use property taxes. So one thing about these constraints is it makes county government super creative. <laughs> We're gonna be really creative about coming up with funding cocktails and partnerships in order to get transit pushed out to those communities that could really, really use it. Well, it makes sense because as Austin proper becomes more and more expensive, people are moving mm -hmm. out to the outlying areas in the county, and that transportation cost, as you said, is huge in a family budget. It is. It's really big. Not to mention the, the issues with climate change. Our major contribution to greenhouse gases in Travis County is our tailpipe. Well, let's move on to climate change. So uh, flood control is something that the county mm -hmm. is involved in. Um, and we've seen that up close and personal in the last oh. five years. Um, yes. What's being done on flood control within the county and what are some ways county government can address the ever-changing environment that we're dealing with uh, in Central Texas? We had two deadly floods in a less than 12 month period in an area of the county that was not in the FEMA floodplain. So, Double whammy. Yeah. Um, we have seen epic wildfires, um, the slow-moving environmental crisis of drought, um, and, and also some really tragic flooding. So there's no doubt that climate change is affecting us. Um, even though the deadly flooding was occurring largely in areas that were not in the FEMA floodplain at the time, we've gotten some new information, not yet from FEMA, because they take a while to adjust all their boundaries, but new information from the National Oceanic, what does NOAA stand for? National oh, Oceanic, anyway, Administ that Something thing. administration. Right, 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 <laughs> that thing. Uh, indicating that um, uh, our floodplains should be much wider. It's something called Atlas 14. Okay. So we took the Atlas 14 data and went ahead and incorporated it into our own bond program as well as all of our permitting. So now we have a much better understanding of um, our likely, likely to flood properties and we are holding ourselves and our development community to new standards with regard to where you can build. Um, I wanted to make sure, the full commissioner's court wanted to make sure uh, that we, what was good for the goose was good for the gander. We are not requiring of developers anything that we're not requiring of ourselves. Whoops. Um, so we actually increased our $200 million bond program by $30 million in order to adjust our own uh, projects to the Atlas 14 standard. Um, it's an expense, it's a change in how we think of things. It does mean a lot more property in Travis County is now off the rolls for development. But we think that's appropriate. We can't have people living in harm's way. Um, we've always been flood alley. I think that the statistic is that we flood, we have more flash floods in Central Texas than anywhere in the world. I believe it. Having lived here as long as I have, I definitely believe that. And there have to be uh, structures in place to you know, make sure that these continue, these don't continue to happen and people are left homeless. That's right. 
So we have to be much more aware of where we're likely to flood and also have a good plan for responding to it. So we are in partnership with the city of Austin as well as the 13 emergency service districts throughout the county to make sure that we respond in, uh, in crisis, but also that we prepare so that we don't put people in crisis. Um, and that we plan appropriately, which is hard, because again, back to the Texas legislature, we don't have land use authority. Counties can't zone. Counties don't, uh, aren't allowed to have a residential building code. So right now the city of Austin is entrenched in drawing battle lines over how it can zone and develop, and in the county, you're not allowed to do any of that. Nope. Well, maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> maybe you don't have to talk about it for a long time. Anymore. But it's not a good thing. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I am jealous that the cities have yeah, zoning authority. I understand that. I can't prevent a, a landfill from being next to a school, um, as we've seen on 290 East. Um, I can't prevent a large development from going in right next to a conservation easement. Um, that's why we have 30,000 acres of Balcones Canyon land preserved, because we're trying to um, preserve uh, endangered species habitat in an area that doubles in population every 30 years. So if someone lives in a rural area and say their children attend an elementary school and a bar wants to build next door, topless bar, let's say, or, or something that would be more unseemly mm -hmm. near, near children. What, what authority do they turn to if they want to fight that thing? Well, the legislature does give us that one little skinny piece of land use authority. We can keep a strip bar from moving in next to a church or a school. Okay. Anything <laughs> else you, you have the right to keep away? Not really. Okay. So, if so I chose the one example that you actually do. Yes. Have. Yeah. So yeah, strippers can't be next to schools, but landfills can. Oh. Pig farms can. Um, a cement batch plant can. Um, uh, people could, you could have a cement batch plant right next to a municipal utility district that has a well. We had a community in North Austin, North Travis County, um, that had a municipal utility district and a municipal well that was polluted by a concrete batch plant in Williamson County. Um, and that's really frightening as a parent to yeah. think that your children are being exposed to pollution. Yes, yes, it's very concerning. It's very concerning. Uh, tire recycling facilities right next to um, communities, um, residential houses, children playing in backyards with the smell of burning tires. So do these people have to seek out private help? Um, um, do they have to go to the state to appeal their case? What, what happens? Uh, the state is a very property rights state and it's very hands off in the unincorporated area. The belief is in unincorporated areas you are essentially on your own. Um, buy more property and, and build it up around you so that you don't have to deal with nuisances on the other side. The problem with that, and, that, and I don't want to throw the, city, uh, the, the state under the bus, um, the, that springs from a belief that unincorporated areas in Texas are rural. But as we well know in Travis County, the unincorporated areas of Travis County are not rural anymore. That's where everybody's moving. Yeah. There are still some pockets of rural, mostly because the city or the county have purchased them or put a conservation easement on them, but the rest of it is developing very rapidly. So you have population concentrations that look like cities, but have no city authorities. You mentioned unincorporated areas. Talk about getting clean water to all parts of the county, because I know mm -hmm. that that's something that uh, you have listed as an accomplishment that finally there's been some areas that went without running drinking water in the yes. county that now have them. Talk about that. Um, we have come across this in, in my years on the commissioner's court. I've been on the commissioner's court as a, a commissioner or county judge since 2007. Um, these issues of drinking water keep coming up, whether it's Northridge Acres in northern Travis County, Travis County, Kennedy Ridge over in northeast Travis County, now Las Lomitas in southeast Travis County, where we find individuals and communities that don't have safe drinking water in their homes. Um, it's each one is a little bit different. The cause, the reason that they don't have drinking water is a little bit different each time, but basically it stems from 
the fact that there is no um, statewide or even countywide uh, water wastewater infrastructure. Pretty much if you live in unincorporated Texas, you're expected to get your own water somehow, um, either through a private contract or through the development of a municip municipal utility district or purchasing it from something called a CCN, con uh, Certificate of Convenience and Necessity, which doesn't tell you anything what the heck is a CCN. It's, it's a water wastewater provider. Um, the problem is um, some of these areas have been developed too far away from any of those resources. So in the case of Las Lomitas, those are 10 acre tracts um, that were sold in a pretty, um, how will I put it? It was unscrupulous to sell these folks 10 acre tracts, promising them water, wastewater, and roadway infrastructure, and never providing it. Um, so there's about 25 families out on these larger acre tracts with no water or wastewater. So we're looking for uh, ways, along with Creedmoor Maha, who is the water provider out there, to get them running water. The first four families were hooked up last month. Uh, the remaining families, we need to fix some things with the fact that they have 10 acre flag lots, which were, are technically illegally platted, but not through any fault of their own. So we need to fix that, get them a water line up the middle of those plats so that they can connect in. And we're gonna do that, and we're gonna do that for the next batch of residents like Las Lomitas that we find. There's just no excuse for a Travis County resident in 2020 to not have safe drinking water coming out of their faucet in their home. I want to talk about workforce development. You mentioned the high unemployment rate we have in our region. One of the goals is, though, to fill those middle school, this, those middle skills jobs. Um, you know, I think the average age of an electrician now is 60 years old. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of these trades are good living, mm -hmm. and people aren't going into it as often as um, I think people would like. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what's going on with that regionally? Because I know there was a goal to have so many middle skills jobs in the region by a certain year. How are we doing with that, and what's being done to, to lift up those, those jobs to the community? We're doing really well, actually. I just came from a meeting yesterday out at Workforce Solutions updating us on the 10,000 by 2021 goal. So we're looking for 10,000 current Travis County residents who are working, but they're not in a, in a, in a career that will provide them a, a living wage, a livable wage. Um, we wanna find 10,000 of those folks and upskill them into either a tech, healthcare, or skilled trades job that will give them a career trajectory. And we've been really successful in the skilled trades area, and I wanna brag on a, a specific skilled trade, by no means the only one, but the plumbers and pipe fitters have been particularly amazing in this area. They're very active. We did a profile on a young woman who became a pipe fitter, well, and then, I think that story was shared more than anyone we did. I was, think you, then yeah. you would be well aware. The women plumbers are extremely active, and they're going out to um, high schools and identifying young women who are young mothers and saying, you want to become a plumber? Because this is a great career. It's a great job. We will help you, we will uh, put you in an apprentice program, we will train you up, we will help you find childcare, um, and we will mentor you. And that has been wildly successful. Um, electrical workers have been amazing, uh, helping us find these 10,000 folks and upskilling them. And then we also have a new initiative call, called five by, uh, 5 by 500, or 500 by 5, in any case. We're looking for 500 uh, employers to commit to identifying five employees within their own organization that they will upskill through tuition assistance, um, on-the-job training, and uh, mentoring and apprenticeship so that they are growing their own. Um, Travis County is already doing that. We're committed to find, we'll find way more than five in, in a uh, local government with 5,000 employees and a significant number of them making less than a $40,000 a year job. Um, we can find a lot of folks to upskill. 
So it sounds like that particular effort is, is a big success so far. Part of it is spreading the word, though, that these opportunities are available to mm -hmm. people, and they can change careers midlife, or maybe they're getting out of the military, or or whatever. they may be coming out of the state jail system with a criminal conviction, which makes it very difficult. So we have a workforce development pro program specifically, it's a Travis County workforce development program, specifically for folks who have felony records. And we have a very good track record of working with employers um, to bring on folks who have a felony record, but they're, they're ready and willing to be an important part of their team. Um, we are finding tremendous success at workforce development. So if you do want to upskill, if you are looking for a change, or if you're an employer wanting to figure out how to grow your own, call Workforce Solutions. Get involved in Workforce Solutions efforts. Um, they're doing just tremendous work. It's data-driven. We are finding ways to upskill folks. Um, Travis County has long had two programs, the Rapid Employment Model and the Gainful Employment Model, where we use those contract dollars that I was talking about, that $22 million. Right. We contract with specific nonprofits who, have, who are able to demonstrate that they can rapidly reemploy individuals who have uh, uh, fallen out of the workforce and that they can gainfully, they, they can train up for gainful employment individuals who are looking to go from, say, a bartending job to becoming a phlebotomist. Um, so we fund those nonprofits who have demonstrated that they can perform as a rapid employer or a gainful employer. Now we will also be looking at what we have REM, we have GEM, and now we have GOO, <laughs> Grow Our Own. Grow our How own. can we assist the private sector employers in identifying their frontline workers who are making under $40,000 a year and upskill them into their organization? There's no more loyal employee than somebody who you have personally invested in. When we've got a 2.4% unemployment rate, People are looking for good employees, and they're hoping that they stay. An employee will stay with you if you invest in them. It's the flip side of having a great economy, is that some of these jobs, they don't have enough people to fill them in the healthcare field and other fields. So mm -hmm. hopefully this will start filling in those gaps. You've referenced several times the 3.5% property tax cap mm -hmm. that was passed by the legislature. And, and I read just recently the Travis County Appraisal District said it won't be reappraising homes in 2020 because there's not enough accurate data. Th this sounds like uh, twice as much trouble for Travis County if you're being told you can only raise your property taxes by 3.5% and um, there's not new data reappraising homes for 2020. What is that going to mean to your budget? The, the reappraisal issue actually doesn't affect um, the county or the city. It could very deeply the affect districts. the school districts. Uh, but for the county, whether your house increases in value in an appraisal this year or not, um, will not have a material effect on exactly. our effective tax rate. That's not worth going into, it's too wonky. Um, but the 3.5% revenue cap most definitely will. Because no matter what your house is reappraised at, um, we can't go more than 3.5% above effective in any given year without going to election. Um, the truth is, we rarely do go above 3.5. But it's nice to have that cushion in times of serious economic downturn. We've only gone close to the 8% rollback, which is where it was before. Um, during times of economic downturn. And um, that is certainly not right now. Not right now. And that's the, re the way we've been able to reduce the tax rate pretty significantly over the last several years since we've been recovering from the economic downturn. We've reduced the tax rate as the um, um, economy has improved. With such a low uh, a cap now, the 3.5, we will no longer be able to have a real-time reduction in tax rate as economy gets better. We will need to reserve money in case we have an economic downturn um, because we don't have the flexibility of an 8% rollback. Um, it, it's a big problem for us. We assumed that by 2025, 
we would have roughly $33 million more in tax capacity um, without the 3.5% rollback. Now with the 3.5% rollback rate, um, we're scrambling to figure out how to pay for stuff. We have $33 million less than our planning horizon anticipated. At the same time, we double in population every 30 years. So this is going to be difficult. We're going to have to tighten our belt and find, um, you know, shake out the couch cushions and find everything that we can. But it makes bringing up a public defender's office harder. It makes bringing up a crime lab that's uh, scientifically run and independent much harder. It makes expanding transit to the unincorporated areas much more difficult. And it makes overall transportation infrastructure um, uh, investments and the maintenance and operation necessary for them much harder. But you can understand why property tax relief is so important to so many people in Travis County because many of us have seen our home values rise to the point mm -hmm. where it's very difficult to make those property tax payments every year. A lot of people my age have moved out of Austin proper because they just can't afford the, the taxes even though their homes are paid for. So it's, it's a double-edged sword. It is. And we don't, uh, at the county level, we don't establish what the revenue source is. The legislature does. The legislature has chosen that local governments, uh, county governments, be funded on property tax. That is a decision by the Texas legislature. Again, we're just an arm of the state. But there will never be an income tax in Texas probably in our lifetime. Probably not. A state income tax. And uh, my good friend, Judge Glenn Whitley in Tarrant County, who's a Republican and a CPA, <laughs> has run the calculations and uh, looked at all the credible websites, and he, being very conservative, says that the combined state and local tax burden for the average Texan um, puts us at 36th in the nation for combined state and local tax burden. 36th. So when you consider we don't have a property, uh, an income tax, right. that means that most people who are median income and above are paying less in taxes than almost anyone else in the United States. But it also means that people who are on the lower end are paying a much larger percentage of their overall income because we don't have an income tax. So if you are that mom who makes $37,000 a year and you're living in your family home that your mom and dad bought 30 years ago, but it's tripled in value during that time period, you can't afford your property it's cost taxes. cost prohibitive, right. That's right. We're in the home stretch now. We only have about 10 minutes. I, I do want to talk to you about the relationship between the other county judges. I mm. had the honor of hosting a, a panel with all the regional county <laughs> judges, and I didn't realize, but it makes sense. You all work pretty closely together because all of these issues, transportation, affordability, they're regional issues, and they, they need to be solved regionally. So talk about that relationship with the other county judges and how it benefits the rest of us. Sure. The county judges get along really well. Um, uh, Republican, Democrat, um, Williamson County, Bastrop County, Caldwell County, Hayes County. Um, we have a really good group. I'm the chair of the Conference of Urban Counties and demographically I am an anomaly. Most of the judges of the urban counties are older than me and male. <laughs> and most of them are Republicans. Um, we work very, very well together. The six big counties, uh, um, the judges of the six big counties get together on a regular basis and um, swap stories about their challenges and their victories. And we exchange ideas on how we can meet our transportation needs, our criminal justice needs, um, our emergency service needs. And then the surrounding counties also, we have a very good working relationship, whether uh, I'm meeting with Judge Poppy on water issues or meeting, in Bastrop. Mm -hmm, or meeting with Judge Gravel up in Williamson County on transportation issues, um, meeting with Judge Becerra down in Hayes County on criminal justice reform and swapping, you know, swapping challenges there, um, uh, meeting with Judge Oakley yeah. on, on transportation issues and emergency services. It was services. just refreshing for me as a journalist to see these people from many different political persuasions coming from 
from disparate regions in some ways, mm -hmm. but all in this together, working across the aisle and trying to solve problems together. I wish we could do that more on the national level. I do too. I wish we could do it more on the national, state, and even local level. Mm -hmm. um, I, I certainly have had my moments where I am not proud of, but if we could find ways to more often reach, um, you know, address our challenges, recognizing our differences, and be able to reach across geographic lines, across party lines, um, uh, past these, these positional uh, divisions, we could get so much more done. Um, we could share more. And I think by, I mean, I used to tell my kids, if you say that toy is yours and nobody else can use it, you're going to have fewer toys. But if you share your toys, you're going to have a lot more. <laughs> well, I, I know that this is not the conversation or the place to talk about running for office. And, and there's been a lot of people talking about running for Kirk Watson's seat in the state Senate. And I know you're one of them. But my question relating to that is this distrust for politicians and this divisiveness and rancor is at an all-time high. What do you think is the role of local government and political leaders, and why is that trust so eroded right now? I think it's eroded because there's a very popular and, and powerful political message out there that's been used by both parties, frankly, um, that says that government is at least incompetent, if not corrupt. Um, in my experience, that simply isn't true. We have a lot of challenges. We don't always meet them as a community, but we must meet them as a community. Um, democracy is us. I am a representative elected by a, a constituency that, that includes 1.3 million people. Um, I'm here to serve. We don't always get it right. But we're always trying. And so I think that local government exists to be very close to the people. I have people pull up on me, you know, pull up next to me on my bicycle to tell me what they think needs to happen. I'm sure, I'm sure <laughs> I do. <laughs> I have people, I was, at the, um, I was at a coffee shop out at the Wyatt Oak Hill yesterday. It was yesterday morning, and the guy who was making my coffee said, I need to know what's going on with the Kinder Morgan pipeline and what's happening with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the delisting of the, black cat uh, of the golden cheek warbler. This was the guy who was making my coffee. Um, we that's have a very educated region. That's how close to mm -hmm. the people local government is. Yeah. And when he started talking to me, some other woman walked up and said, are you Judge Eckhart? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, we have this person in common and this person in common and this person in common. And what are we going to do about federal politics? Sarah, please tell me how to vote. <laughs> I mean, it is, it, it, we, we are in the community. We are of the community. Um, so I see all kinds of opportunity for us to reach out across party lines and reach out across geographic differences, reach out uh, across city-county divides and find solutions um, and be willing to compromise. If you want to be pure, if you want to stay absolutely pure and unsullied, stay behind the barricades and just keep lobbing bombs. But if you want to get something done, you're going to have to come out beyond the barricade and be willing to compromise. That's uncomfortable. Um, it's difficult. I would submit that the bigger radical is not the one behind the barricade throwing bombs. The bigger radical is the one who's in the middle willing to risk to find a compromise that moves us forward. And Senator Watson has demonstrated what that looks like. We have one minute left, and I want you get to give us a one minute call to action. How can we as citizens of Travis County hold our elected officials' feet to the fire, and what can we do to ensure the county remains strong? Um, I think the biggest thing is to do just that, hold our feet to the fire. 
If you want to watch a Tuesday uh, work session or voting session, check out what we do. Find an issue that's really important to you. Follow it. Uh, email us. Call us. I have a coffee jolt every uh, third Thursday of the month in an independent coffee shop someplace in Travis County. Show up, tell me what I'm doing wrong. Tell us what we're doing wrong. Um, tell us what we're doing right. We always appreciate somebody telling us that we're doing something <laughs> right. Uh, but we also really benefit from people telling us what's wrong and giving us um, suggestions on how to solve it. Okay. And also looking for ways to reach out to the folks that you think are a villain reach out to them and try and understand what's their intention, what perspective are they coming from, and find a way to meet them in the middle. It will make you intensely uncomfortable. Um, but that's where, that's where civics really exists. That's where it gets exciting, when you take yourself out of your comfort zone to try and understand the, you know, all sides of an issue. There's never just two. Well, thank you for helping us understand some of the issues at stake here in Travis County with this year's State of the County Address. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate everybody who came out to attend today and those of you watching online and you heard the judge, get involved in civics. Watch the county issues and weigh in on things that you care about. That's what democracy is all about. And Take help us with the census. Yes, we didn't, get a chance. we didn't get a chance to talk about the census, but please get out and volunteer and help count, especially the hard to count community. Absolutely, the census is super important. It will affect us for the next 10 years. Census, census, census. Thanks so much for watching. <laughs> we didn't have time to talk about the census.